Chris, I appreciate that introduction. Yes, uh, I do uh, essentially wealth coaching. And what I realized when I started into this business was giving somebody an investment strategy and a financial plan doesn't help people build wealth any more than giving somebody a gym membership gives them a six pack. So if education is the transference of information, I believe coaching is about application and execution. It's not what you know, it is what you do. And over these last several weeks, we've been talking about mindset, we've been talking about habits, we've been talking about our identity and how we even look at life and look at what we've been given as Christians, as children of God. And I wanna to talk to you guys about some of my background in, well, not really about my background, but what I've learned in my background. So before I started my financial planning practice, I had the privilege of training some professional athletes, some Olympic athletes, uh, some soldiers, um, even some UFC fighters. So I have the privilege of being beaten up by UFC fighters, been beaten up by a couple people that weren't UFC fighters, but both those girls were really mean. Um, <laughs> But what I've learned is all these principles and practices about creating sustainable behavior change. So what we're gonna be talking about today is from now on, living a life of abundance. Living a life of abundance. But it starts with changing our behavior, what we do, our habits, the actions we take each and every day. So I believe that coaching is inspiring and supporting meaningful and sustainable actions directed at purposeful impact. And what is so cool about this is all these things I've studied and learned over the past 15, 20 years, really, it's stuff that was in scripture all along. So I love it when, when science and business catches, yeah, I did science in air quotes, science and business catches up to what God has been telling us all along. And you think about it, like, some of the things just been on the news recently, like, or, or in, you know, popular science recently, the importance of, of fasting, right? Um, servant leadership, gender identity. Well, the world's still struggling with that one. But all of these things are things that have been in Scripture. God has been teaching us for thousands of years. Think about even in the, inside the church, people taking financial peace for the first time. And like, wait a minute, we can stop buying things with money that we don't have to impress people we don't even like? And we don't have to drown in debt? Like, that's amazing. And God's like, oh, you guys... Solomon told you this 3,000 years ago, but he didn't have a YouTube channel, so you didn't listen to him, so I had to send you Dave Ramsey. And we're like just now getting it, but it's been there for so long. And before you guys think like, you know, I'm some sort of like hotshot performance coach, I want to share with you real quickly about one of the biggest challenges that I've ever faced in coaching. And it started about six weeks ago when I was tricked into teaching my son's flag football team. And it's a volunteer position, um, and I will tell you guys, they're getting exactly what they paid for. I'm working for free. And we were, we, this is just a few weeks ago, and we're in the huddle, and I'm trying to explain to these kids, uh, you know, okay, I was like, okay, you guys, I want you guys to go in the end zone over here, and you guys, so you guys are going to block, and I see a hand go off over here, and this kid's like, I'm confused. And I was like, what is it, buddy? What? He goes, who's an end zone? I said, who's an end zone? It's not a who, and I'm trying to explain. I'm like, wait a minute, I'm going to back up a little bit. I was like, who here knows what an end zone is? Two kids raised their hand. Guys, we're four games into the season already. Two kids know what an end zone is. My kid and one other kid, right? And just in case you guys are into, like, European stuff, like soccer and hockey, an end zone is a very important part of football. But it's not just that they don't know anything about football. They don't sit still. They are allergic to doing what they're told. It's like juggling squirrels, which is not a real phrase, but just think of how frustrating that would be. And like I have to physically move them to where they're supposed to be. I'm like, you just stand here, and then you, you stand here. And, because everybody's moving around until the ball is snapped, and then it's like everybody's a statue. I was like, oh, now you going to be still? And you know, so I, I got them in their place. I'm moving over here. I'm going to work with these guys. And I look back. One kid over here is following me. Another kid over here is looking for snacks. There's usually one kid, like, staring into the sun. Just, just kidding. We haven't seen the sun all year. Um, and it's cold, right? The kids are crying. I'm crying. 
And it's so frustrating. I'm just like pulling my hair out. Um, <laughs> before this all started, I had like beautiful long flowing locks and it's just <laughs> football ruined it. But that's not what coaching should look like. We're talking about sustainable change toward a purposeful impact. And sometimes as a coach, you have to shift perspective to get people to look at an old thing in a new way. And that's what Paul did in a lot of his letters. So we're going to look at a metaphor as, or of your life as an orchard, your life as a field. And I believe that we are created for an abundant harvest. We, we were designed for an abundant life. So John 10.10 10 says, um, the thief does not come except to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that they may have life, and they have it more abundantly. So with that, I'm going to open us up in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word that we're going to dive into. I thank you that you are the source of all wisdom and discernment. You are the source of true life change. Lord, step into this room. I know you're already here, but open up our hearts. Give us ears to listen and hearts to understand. Soften us that this wouldn't just be a knowledge thing, that we would go out and execute what you have asked us to do. Lord, help us live abundantly. Your sons and we pray. Amen. All right, so our theme verse for today is going to be out of Galatians. And Pastor Ron talked about this the other day. I think it was last week. But I'm just going to read it through again because it kind of paints the picture that we're going to pull all of our lessons from. This is Galatians 6, 7 through 10. It says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will reap corruption. But he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. Let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have the opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. So I think there's three big lessons that we can pull out of that. And the first one is to plant with persistence. The second one is to plant with patience. And lastly, plant with purpose. And when I talk about planting with persistence, it's this idea of not just consistency, but consistency under fire, consistency against opposition, right? And we struggle as human beings, we struggle to be consistent even in the best circumstances. But when we face the opposition that, that the Bible promises we will face, that's what causes us to lose heart. So consistency in the face of opposition. Pastor Ron talked about this last week, talking about habits, New Year's resolutions, how difficult it is for us not to do the right thing once, but to consistently, continually do the right thing. And if you guys doubt this, just go into a gym on January 1st, and everybody's gung-ho. You know, you got people in there that have worked out in 20 years. They're, like, downloading Special Forces workouts because, you know, why not do what the Green Berets do, you know? And go back in there in February, nobody's there. Thankfully, because those New Year's people are so irritating. But we are not consistent. We lose faith. We lose heart. And Galatia, in, right in the middle of that, we have Galatians 6, 9, in the middle of our passage. It says, let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. If we will just hang in there. If we just don't quit. So several years ago, about six years ago, I was at a business conference down in San Diego. And it was a break between sessions. And this guy comes up to me, never seen him before, never met him. And he's like, I just wanted to meet you. You have tremendous pectorals. And this is how he started the conversation. Now, I was homeschooled in the 80s. And some of you are already laughing, and that's not cool. Um, and it wasn't cool. And I don't know if homeschooling is cool now, but it definitely wasn't cool back then. So I may not understand like all the social nuances, but I'm pretty sure like this is not how you start a normal like human interaction. So I'm feeling like a little vulnerable. I'm like, you know, eyes up here, bud. And he just he won't give it up. He's like, so like, what do you do? You do like the dumbbells or you know, chest flies, and and I'm getting a little irritated at this point. So he's like, what's your secret? So I just I was like, there's no secret, just sacrifice. I haven't missed a workout in 10 years. And it was a little abrupt and not super nice, so I felt bad, and I'm kind of break it down a little bit more, and I said, everything you do, everything that you just listed will work if you keep doing it. 
It doesn't matter which of those exercises you're doing or in which order. It matters that you continue to execute it. And guys, that's the point that I want to make today is it's about not quitting. It's about endurance. Now, what you do does matter. We're, we're going to get into that. But first, you have the mindset that you will not quit. There is no perfect exercise. There is no perfect translation. Pick a, I mean, to a point, pick a good translation. Even if it doesn't have a bunch of like these and nows and sounds like Shakespeare wrote it, it, that's okay. Read it. Read your Bible every day. There's a lot of different people that have, you know, you should pray using this method and pray using that method. And don't worry about that. Just you have access to the creator of the universe. Talk to him. Engage him in conversation. It's a dialogue. Stop and listen every now and then. So just we as Christians, when we are trying to live an abundant life, we have to be willing to do consistently what most Christians only do occasionally. It's not what you do one day. It's what you do every day that matters. So let's just, let's just think about this. So prayer. How would your life change if you prayed consistency like, like Daniel did three times a day and you, pl- you prayed as a first response and not as a last resort? What if you started each day with writing down specific things that God has blessed you, blessed you with? And thanking him every single night for specific opportunities he's placed in your life. What would it look like if you actually read your Bible every single day? This is not new. This is not the first time you've heard this up here. Like, oh, re- read my Bible. I should, that, that makes sense. We know what we're supposed to do. We don't stay consistent. And if you guys read your Bible, if this building, the people in this church read their Bible every single day, it wouldn't just change your lives. Guys, we would change this city if we stay consistent, obeying what we already know to do. But that's where it gets hard. Like we're human beings and we struggle with consistency. Some of the, and nobody's too big to fail. Some of the most prominent people in the Bible, the people that had everything going for them, all the opportunity, they failed to stay consistent. So there is a reward, there is a harvest if you'll just hang in there. Colossians 1, 21 through 23 says, and you were once alienated and enemies, by, enemies in your mind by wicked works. Yet now he is reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy, blameless, and above reproach in his sight. If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away. For the hope of the gospel, from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. I love this passage because it shows the extreme of where we were, alienated, distant enemies of God, to being presented holy and blameless. If we remain steadfast, if we stay the course, if we do not lose heart, and are not moved away. And the the Bible is littered with men and women who were moved away. Think of Saul. And he had everything going. He was crowned the first king of Israel. His life ended in tragedy, not just for him, but his entire family, right? Think of Samson. Everybody knows Samson and Delilah, but the story starts long before that. His life was a picture of a lot of small decisions that drifted him, that pulled him away from the path that God put him on. Ron talked about that a few weeks ago. It was not one incident. It was a habit of pulling, and pulling himself away from God. Think of Solomon, the, the wisest guy that ever lived had 700 wives. Like, that is a terrible idea. I'm married to a twin. Sometimes that's like being married to two people. It is hard. And then Solomon's like, I'm going to do this 698 more times? Like, what an idiot. But the Bible says his wives pulled him away from God. Some of you guys are thinking my wife does that too. No, it's not her fault. It's your fault. Um, You're still responsible. But Psalm, the wisest man that ever lived, still moved away. So if we can just... Stay steadfast. But we, we, want, we want the harvest without the hardship, right? We want the reward without the rigor. When things get hard, we lose heart. We stop. We quit. The Bible promises, not that when you start following God, life is going to ease the body. The Bible promises it will get harder, but he will remain faithful. In 1 Peter 5, 8 through 10, says, Be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. We're not alone in this. We're all suffering. We're all struggling. 
But may the God of grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Like that is powerful. But you notice the order there. It's after the suffering. So we will be perfected, we'll establish, strengthened, and settled after the suffering. We, we have to fight through those battles. And, and I love that picture of resist. Like we have a fight on our hands. Even if you don't recognize the power that is in you, Satan does. And he will come after you. You will have opposition. You need to stay consistent in the midst of opposition. Pastor Ron talked about training, not trying. And I was just thinking about this as it relates to this passage. If we think of the pain that is involved in life, life is painful, but training is pain with a purpose. So my encouragement to you today is, is connect your pain with the kingdom purpose. That's what keeps you going. That's what keeps you consistent. And you guys have all heard the story. Rome wasn't built in a day. But Rome was built every day. Every day. Do the little bit. Do the small things. But keep working forward. Keep on that path. Resist the devil. Resist, resist the evil one. And stay consistent. Now, the next principle that I want to talk to you about is patience. Plant with patience. Okay, this is the idea of, of allowing God in due time, going back to the, the Galatians verse, in due time there will be a harvest. But it isn't right now. And he was talking to an agrarian culture that would have understood that. Like if, if you're hungry today, you better plant it something six months ago. You know, there was no fast food. There was no McDonald's back then. Pastor Ron would have hated it. We didn't, we didn't have things quickly, but today we do. We have a microwave society. My kids get upset when it takes like four minutes to download a movie. Was, when I was a kid, it took two years for that movie to come out at Blockbuster. <laughs> then we had to walk down there. Actually, it was uphill in the snow both ways. And then when you got the movie, you bring it home, you're excited to watch it, you pop it in, and you had to rewind it because the jerk that got it in front of you, even though it says right on there, be kind, rewind. Like that's his only job. And now you've already waited two years. Now you've got to wait ten minutes. Some of these people, like, they don't even know what rewind means. They've never had to rewind anything. You guys don't know how good you have it. But am I right? Like, we are so impatient. In this. We want everything right now. And if we can't microwave it, we don't want it. So let me just give you a real quick financial example. Because we're looking at planning with patience and let like God compounding over time. So when we hear about compounding, a lot of times it is referred to compound returns, compound interest. So I want to give you guys a little example. How many of you guys could come up with $5 a day? Five extra dollars a day. Now, for some of you guys, it would be really easy. For some of you, it would take a sacrifice. You might have to cut out the, the coffee in the morning. Uh, you might have to cut out your, your streaming services, which not just steals your money, but also steals your time. Some of you might have to get rid of your vehicle payment, sell your car, drive something you can actually afford, which means you pay cash for it. That was a little harsh, but Dave Ramsey made me say it. <laughs> so $5 a day, if you were to save $5 a day from 18 until 60 years old, you would have saved $75,000. That's not small. $5 a day becomes $75,000. But that's just the cumulative effect. There's no compounding. If we compound that with 10% annual returns, just 10% return on average every year, that $5 a day isn't $75,000. It's a million dollars from $5 a day. Now, several of you raised your hand and said that you have an extra $5 a day. How many of you guys have an extra million dollars sitting around? And don't raise your hand because I don't want you guys to get mugged. All right? The, you know, I've got six kids to feed and this this flag football coaching thing doesn't pay well. So, um, but just think about that. A lot of us got an extra $5, but not a lot of us have an extra million because it takes time. We are often not patient enough to let time run its course. So let me just, let me just unpack that a little bit more when it, when it comes to, well, I've actually got a cute little, I've got a cute little uh, equation I already warned you I was homeschooled. Um, my wife still doesn't get it. She's, we were talking about books or something the other day, and she's like, oh my, you are such a nerd. 
I was like, yeah, when you met me, I was finishing up a biochemistry degree. Like, my cards were on the table. You knew what you were getting into. But I want you to think of this idea of, of seeds, small seeds, plus time to the exponent of God. So we're so focused on how small those seeds are that we plant, we forget about the exponent of God. And that's what makes all the difference. But we have to be willing to start small. There's no one push-up that makes you fit. There's no one dollar that makes you wealthy. It's the accumulation and compounding of a lot of small things over time. So in Luke 16.10, Jesus says, He who is faithful in what is, sorry, he who is faithful in what is least is also faithful in much. He who is unjust in what is least is also unjust in what is least. How you show up with little things is how you show up in big things. That's why Ron emphasized, Pastor Ron emphasized habits so much last week. Because that's how we train ourselves to do the little and big things. Some people are struggling with financial issues. And they just think, if I make more money, that will solve my problem. Well, I'm going to tell you from experience, if you are not a good steward with a small amount of money, if somebody gives you a lot of money, it makes a bad problem worse. Just think of it. Like if somebody you know, probably your teenager, is struggling with driving and they're using your family minivan like a bumper car, the answer is not more horsepower. Like, Dad, I know I clipped seven mailboxes on the way home, but, Dad, if I had a Ferrari, I would be a much better driver. No, it makes a bad problem worse because they're not a steward of what you've already given them. We have to be willing to let God, or let, sorry, we have to be willing to start slow, start small, and let God provide the increase. Another problem with patience is that we can't measure miracles as they're happening, as they're growing. And in Mark chapter 4, Jesus talks about this. He says, the kingdom of God is if a man should scatter seed on the ground. That's our job. Our job is scattering seeds. And he should sleep by night and rise by day, and the seeds should sprout and grow. He himself does not know how. For the earth yields its crops by itself, first the blade, then the head, and after the full grain in the head. But when the grain ripens, immediately he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. So our job is to scatter seeds of righteousness. God's job is to make them grow. But in that verse, there is... a this picture of uncertainty. He's planting the seeds in the ground, but he doesn't know exactly how it's all going to work out. And it starts small. First the blade, little shoot, you know, and then the head starts to come out. But it's, it doesn't happen all at once. It takes time. Start small, let God provide the increase. Remember, before God taught Peter how to catch men, he was giving him fishing lessons. David did not start with Goliath. And I've got got a whole thing on this. We can talk about it later. Maybe they'll invite me back one day. I'll tell you more. But Goliath, I do not believe, is an underdog story. Goliath is a story about inspired preparation. And here's how I know this. Number one, 1 Samuel 17 talks about David and Goliath. 1 Samuel 16, David was already introduced as a warrior and a mighty man of valor. And when he's talking to Saul, and Saul's like, you've never fought giants before. You've never done this before. And David's like, you're right, but this isn't my first rodeo. He's like, I've protected my dad's flocks for years. I've fought lions and bears. I've grabbed a lion by its beard and struck him till he died. That's intense. Like, there's people in this room that wouldn't hunt a lion behind a cage with a rifle. David's grabbing it by its beard and striking it till it's died. And here's something a lot of people don't realize about this story is if you go back to 1 Samuel 13, there's a passage in there that talks about there were no swords and spears in Israel because the Philistines controlled the iron trade. They didn't want the uprising of the Israelites. So they didn't have swords and spears except for Paul and Jonathan, or Saul and Jonathan. David didn't have a sword. What did he kill the lion with? I don't have the answer, but why don't you think about that? He grabbed a lion by its beard with no sword, no spear, no 44 mag, probably beat it to death with a club or a rock. When he's faced with a giant, he's like, wait a minute, I get to use weapons? This is going to be a piece of, get, get, let me go at him. He had been prepared for years, but he started small. Think about Joseph. We, we see the end of his story. He is one of the most prominent figures in Egypt. He's leading a nation. Do you guys remember where Joseph learned his leadership lessons? In prison. In prison as a foreigner. 
Now, I don't know what Egyptian prisons were like, but I'm guessing it wasn't great. And I know we all have obstacles in our life, and we, we look at the insignificance of what we can bring to the table. But think of, think of all the excuses Joseph would have had. I'm in prison. I don't speak this language. God can't use me here. But that's not what happened. If we look at Genesis 39, 21 through 23, it says, But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy. He gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners who's in the, who were in the prison. Whatever they did there, it was his doing. The keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. The Lord compounded it. Now just think if you were Joseph, you were hearing this narrative, like the Lord made it prosper. He's like, wait a minute, I'm confused, just like that kid on my team. I'm still in prison. God, have you forgotten about that? God's like, no, 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 you're still prospering. So if you guys know the story, it doesn't turn around right there. Joseph's, Joseph gets forgotten in prison. He interprets a couple dreams and then gets forgotten. And I'm sure he even felt forgotten by God at times. But he stayed persistent. He stayed patient. And then Pharaoh has a dream. God brings, or God brings that dream into the interpretation into Joseph's heart. And they bring Joseph before Pharaoh. He interprets the dream. And we'll speed up the story here. Joseph ends up the second leading ruler in Egypt. He went to bed, or sorry, he, he woke up that morning in prison. He went to bed in a palace. To the world, he looked like an overnight success. People were like, who is this Joseph guy? Like, he's got no Instagram page, no website. Like, we don't even know who this guy is. But he was an overnight success that was 13 years in the making. Small seeds that Joseph planted every single day, even when it looked like it would not matter. So, we have to remember that the God of the Old Testament that did the miracles is the same God that we serve today. The New Testament God did all the miracles. The God who made the universe from scratch, who parted the Red Sea, who turned water into wine, who took five loaves and two fish and fed an entire countryside with that, who died, was buried, and three days later rose again and sits in heaven right now preparing a place for us. That is the same God we serve. And I challenge you, if you will show up every single day and you just, you put the small sacrifice, five loaves, two fish out there, you will start seeing miracles in your life. I guarantee it. But it's not enough that you're patient. It's not enough that you're persistent. You also have to be planting the right seeds. So we're going to go into this last section here, planting with purpose. Sow carefully and prune often. Too often, we plant the wrong seeds in our life, and we get surprised that the, the harvest is not what we intended. And you guys can be consistent, you can be patient, but if you're consistently and patiently planting the wrong, wrong seeds, you will not have an abundant harvest. And it's what, it's what we do every day. The, the little habits that we ignore, that we don't think about, it, it's planting sick trees, and it produces diseased fruit in our life. Galatians 6, 7 through 8 says, Whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. He who sows to his spirit will reap everlasting life. You get out what you put in, okay? So drinking six packs doesn't lead to six packs, right? We know that. But we still engage in bad behavior anyway. And I, I know this. You know, it's not an education problem. It's an execution problem. We know better and we still act outside of that. Our, our obedience is often outpaced by our knowledge. So here's what I mean. So my office sits between a McDonald's and a Subway. So all day long, I watch people making horrible life decisions. Now, there's a couple of you that are like, what, Subway's bad for me? But Jared lost 400 pounds. Well, Jared did some other things too, so he's not gonna be our role model for today. And I mean, really, guys, let's think about it. You're, you're eating an entire loaf of bread with mystery meat, cheese that don't, doesn't melt. It's being toasted on like a repurposed car radiator by some guy that probably escaped from prison earlier that day. Like, you knew it wasn't a great decision. But if you won't give me Subway, at least give me McDonald's. Like, 
nobody is walking into McDonald's thinking like, oh, this is probably a children's hospital. Uh, maybe I'll play the violin for blind kids. Oh, what's this, a McFlurry? Ah. We know, we're not kicking off the day with a good decision, we're starting off with diabetes, right? So, but we do it anyway, and there's a line that wraps around my office. They're busy. There's a lot of people that act out of accordance with what they know. So Matthew 7, 5, 15 through 20 says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from, grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but every bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. Guys, bad inputs lead to bad outcomes. We have to stop sowing bad seeds, sick trees in our life. And the fruit is just evidence of what's going on underneath. It's just evidence of what's going on inside. In Matthew 15, 18 through 19, it says, but those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart. That's what defiles the man. What comes out here is, is the fruit of what's going on right here. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, murders, adulteries, fornication, thefts, false witness, and blasphemies. We plant bad seeds in our life, and then we're surprised when things don't turn out the way we want them to. Want them to. The harvest betrays the planting process. You have to plant with purpose. A big part of that is pruning. So pruning is the elimination of the things that are holding you back in your life. And just like you would prune a tree to get rid of the branches that aren't producing or pulling weeds out of your garden. And if you guys have ever done a garden, we're two years into it. We've grown approximately nothing. Um, so glad that Costco is still here because if we were self-sustaining, I'd be very skinny right now. Um, but you don't need to plant weeds. They show up. You don't have to invite them. They just start growing, usually better than the stuff you did planted. Our lives are no different. We live in a fallen world. Weeds show up. We have to consistently, in a disciplined manner, prune those things, weed those things out of the orchard, out of the field of our life. Often it's what you eliminate from your life that adds the most value. So in Colossians 3, 12 through 14, there's a, a nice passage, really nice pretty passage about what we are to put on, what, what we are to add into our life as, a, as believers. This is, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, forgo- forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against one another, even as Christ forgave you, so you must also do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. That's a great verse. Great passage. But before he gets to that, there's several verses about everything that we need to put off first. The putting off comes first. Before we can put on Christ, we need to put off the things of the world. So here's a a list of what some of that looks like. Colossians 3, 5 through 10 says, Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sins of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them, when that was the fruit that you were planting. But now you yourselves are to put off these things, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language, out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, who is renewed in the knowledge according to the image of Christ, of him who created him. But before we can put on Christ, we have to put off the world. We need to prune our lives. For some of you, you're wondering why people don't trust you, why you don't get promotions at work, but you're dishonest, you steal from the company. Some of you are wondering why your marriage is struggling, but you treat your spouse like crap, and you're watching other people. You're looking at the opposite sex the way you should be looking at your spouse. And you're not content or happy but your life is riddled with covetousness. You're planting bad seeds and bad trees, and you're surprised by the result. For some of you, you just need to put off the snooze button. That sounded funnier in my head. But, um, but you know, you, you hit snooze three times, 
And then you wonder why you don't have time to spend time. In the, that was your quiet time right there. You snooze through your quiet time. I was just talking with a, a group earlier this morning, and I had to cut out fantasy football. There's nothing wrong with fantasy football. Fantasy hockey and soccer, yes, fantasy football is okay. But I was spending so much time. This is embarrassing. Again, I was homeschooled. I'm a nerd. I, that's, that's my defense. But it was interfering with my time with my family, my time with God. It was interfering with the intentionality of my life. I had to cut it out. So for, for all of us, we have sin areas that we need to prune. But we also have areas that might not be a stumbling block to somebody else. But for us, it's a boulder in our path of righteousness. We need to remove that, get it out of our life. So like Hebrews 12 says, we remove the encumbrances so we can freely chase after Christ. That's what we're going after. Plant with purpose and then prune often. So we've got plant with persistence. Stay consistent in the face of opposition. Plant with patience. Start small and let God multiply. Plant with purpose, slow carefully, sow carefully, and prune often. About two years ago, four years after, three or four years after that first business conference, I'm at another conference. And I'm standing there talking to a group of people, and I see this guy coming towards me. And he's got like that, just like that matrix walk, you know, like I'm like trying to figure out what? This guy is like in a hurry. And I realize. It's the same guy from the other conference. He's followed me for two years and like 2,000 miles. We're now, we're not in San Diego, we're in Orlando now. And he's coming towards me, so I'm getting like my pepper spray ready. I'm looking for a place to hide, you know. I'm thinking about like maybe doing that thing that my kids do, where like if you close your eyes real tight, he can't see me, I can't see him, like that kind of thing. But he comes up to me and he's like, do you remember me? And I was like, yeah, that's why I'm hiding behind this fake plant. And I'm, I'm bracing myself for a really awkward conversation again, but it doesn't happen. Because the next words out of his life, his, his mouth were, you changed my life. And I was completely caught off guard. I was like, what do, you, what do you mean? He's like, do you remember what you told me? To just stay consistent, to don't quit. Don't worry about all the little things that, that, that confuse me, but just show up every day. Pick some exercises and don't give myself excuses. He said, I've lost 70 pounds. My cholesterol is down. My blood pressure is down. I have more confidence. My business is going better. I started with push-ups. That's all I could do. But pretty soon I was working out three, four days a week. And I never skipped a workout. He said, Chad, you changed my life. Guys, think about that. I didn't change his life. Push-ups changed his life. But if push-ups changed his life, what would your life look like if you unleashed the Holy Spirit in your life? And it isn't, it isn't just tapping. I'm talking about unleashing. We're talking about the, the power of Almighty God in your life. Compounding your persistence and your patience. That's what life transformation looks like. But we, we can't do it on our own. We can't do it by ourselves. We need the Holy Spirit. We need to unleash the Holy Spirit in our life. So in Psalm 1, uh, it says, But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in season, whose leaf, whose leaf also should not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. We need to have our roots tapped into life-giving water. That's the only way that we can sustain persistence, patience, and purpose. Otherwise, we give up. We lose heart. We just start small, let God multiply. And guys, there's a, there's a proverb that says, the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The next best time is today. It is never too late to start doing the right thing. It's never, you're never too far gone to start living for Christ. But you have to choose. Start small, let God multiply. Eternity starts right now. Your future, from now on, your future can start today. Start tapping the life-giving water. But there's some of you in this room that aren't connected to the Holy Spirit. You, aren't, you don't know God. You don't have a relationship. And unfortunately, everything I've said the last 40 minutes do not matter unless you know God. John 15, 5 says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. But without me, you can do nothing. Guys, We've talked about execution today, but you cannot execute religion well enough to make up for a lack of relationship. You cannot, 
You cannot do church. You cannot be persistent and purposeful in all these things well enough to gain salvation. You can't be a good enough citizen in the world to become a child of God. Don't put this off. Without water, the trees die. And Matthew 7 says the trees get cut down and thrown into the fire. Don't let that be you. You have an opportunity right now to tap into life-giving water. Be willing to sacrifice who you are now for who God is calling you to be. Eternity can begin today, but you are not promised for tomorrow. You're not promised tomorrow. Joshua told his people, he said, choose today whom you will serve. Today. Make the choice right now. So I'm going to ask you all to stand to your feet. We have prayer time in just a minute. But for all of us, choose today whom you will serve. If you've been off the path, if you've not been executed, if you've been planting the wrong seeds, you've not been patient, you've not been persistent, you want to get things back on track, come down and, and pray here. But if you've never made that choice, if you were on the wrong path, and guys, these are two different paths. It's not like with the Holy Spirit you can just move further down one life path. These are two different roads entirely. You need to get on the road with Christ. Get on the path of a life of abundance. I encourage you to please come down here and pray. There will be pastors down here. I'll sit down here. If you want somebody to pray with you, lead you through it. But don't put this off. Because you don't know if you're going to get another tomorrow.